here. It's been quite a few years, and I've always enjoyed um, everybody I've met here, and, and I really enjoyed meeting the people I've met today. Um, I really lead two lives. Um, I, I work at Stanford as a, in hearing and perception, and <coughs> cocktail party effect, and psychoacoustics, and things like that. And this talk is not going to be about any of that stuff. Um, you know, you, you hear lots of talks from, from friends of Al and, and Caroline, and everybody else in, in that area. And what instead I want to talk about is something you probably don't see a lot of, which is um, an industrial internet perspective on how the web works and how multimedia works. It just fell down. Oh, <laughs> this work better. Um, so I want to talk instead about how we see music and multimedia. Um, the, the talk is um, multimedia in general. Um, my, my love is music and, and audio, and that's where I've spent most of my time. But a lot of the same problems exist in video and images, and so I often use those, that work as a way of getting some things done because you know, images are sometimes easier than music. So genre recognition is the same thing as pattern classification, and you can do emotion in music or video or, or images. Um, and so I'll, I'll illustrate with a lot of different examples. Um, from different domains, but hopefully you can think about this in terms of your own favorite domain. It's the same kind of problem. Um, Yahoo Research is all over the world, and actually I think I'm missing one here. Yeah, we just added Beijing, which is not on here. Um, there's about 200 people in Silicon Valley, just so you know where we're coming from. Um, a lot of machine learning, a lot of people doing computational advertising. How do you figure out which ad you put on a, on a web page and when, and how do you make sure that the advertiser's happy and the user's happy? Um, a lot of stuff in information extraction, how do you figure out you know, what, what are they looking for and how do you put it on a web page so they can find it. Um, a whole bunch of computer science theory and there's also um, um, a whole bunch of stuff on, on social sciences and economics and I work with, <laughs> with all those people. Um, the music people are down in Santa Monica, um, a few hours away from me. Um, and most of those are now transitioning to think about media in general. So um, last I checked, um, music videos were much more popular than playing music. Maybe this is just our site, but you know, people tend to, to watch a video or put a video on instead of listening to music by itself. So it's definitely a multimedia um, experience now, even if you're just interested in music. Um, I'd like to talk about um, how the world has changed over the years. Um, I'm, I'm educated as an engineer, and I think a lot about the information content, and I apply that model to the whole world. And this is this is every slide my dad took in 1964. So he was a photographer and he took a lot of photos. And I think these were a dollar a piece for slides back in his day. So what's that now, five or six dollars or ten dollars a slide? So you know, every slide was something he was really careful about. And the world's changed a lot since then. And you know, you've taken more pictures than this every day. Or any one day, I'm sure you've all taken more pictures than this. And the same is true in music. I mean, before you might have a, 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 you know, a record collection of a few dozen or maybe a few hundred records. And now you have that much on your, in your pockets or on your phone. And so the information is very different and, and, and much more magnitude. Um, if you want later, I've got a video of um, Monty Python um, singing Every Bit is Sacred. Um, so it was nice of them con to collaborate on making this message. But it's not part of today's talk. Um, this is what I want to talk about today, basically three topics. Um, some examples of the world we're coming from and what we're trying to do. Um, and then two different effects that you might not be aware of um, in terms of how we get work done and how we can solve these problems. Um, one is more data. You know, we can solve lots more interesting problems when we throw lots of data at it. And when you have lots of data, it really changes the flavor of the solution. So you know, more data is always good data, but you know, more data also changes the way you do things. And so I've got some examples of how that works, and I'll talk about those. And then there's also better data that's available. And there's a couple different things we've been doing on on using other kinds of data to make judgments about multimedia. So, you know, I'm an engineer, I love audio, I would love to spend all my time doing nothing but analyzing audio waveforms. Um, but it turns out that you can solve these audio problems much better using other kinds of data. And so it's useful to think about those things. And if there's time, um, there's a couple things I can talk about in terms of how we actually get work done at Yahoo on, on these large uh, problems. And I can drop it off if you'd rather. Um, and we'll see how time goes and how many questions are during the time. Um, but it's quite common. I was running on uh, running jobs on on Monday that ran on 400 CPUs at once, and you know I just type a Python command in and it goes off and runs on 400 machines, and that's what I needed and it got done. And that's how we get work done in these things. And machines are not that expensive now. Certainly, machines are a lot cheaper than graduate students. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the power on the hand is very expensive, but the machines are cheap. So if there's time, I'll talk about that at the end. 
Um, and it's really important to say that, you know, we have a very good lab and there's lots of really smart people there, but there's a lot more smart people here at McGill. And so, uh, you know, I want you to think of all these things as starting points. You know, I certainly hope that all of you guys can do better than we can at these problems. Um, you certainly have a lot more new people and creative ideas, and I think that's going to be, that's the power of universities. Um, before I start, I want to talk about how search be works and, and what happens in search, because it certainly was new to me, and it's very different from what I expected um, on how things would work. And this is especially true on multimedia. So I, I, I work in this multimedia lab, work in this research lab where there's a lot of computer science theory people, a lot of information retrieval people, and have this view of the world. It turns out that the model is all broken when it comes to multimedia. So this is a, a very typical graph. We see, I mean, this is like gospel for all of us in the search field. And what it shows is how often did you click on a web page or click on a result on a search page as a function of position. So the first part of the first part of the curve is, you know, these are, this is the probability of clicking on a page up to the bottom of the window, and then it takes a dump, it, it takes a dive. And then it, it continues the same curve, but this is, you know, the user has to click to move down to the bottom of the page. And so that doesn't happen with some fairly large probability. And then at the bottom of the page, there's another jump because then you actually have to go to the next page. So you have to click, click next and wait some number of milliseconds to get the next page. And so this is very typical. And, and I should say this is not, it's very untypical for it to go to one. So this is all scaled. Um, but this is, this is gospel in our field. So, about uh, a couple years ago, um, everybody's doing this now, um, people started putting multimedia at the top. You know, so you search for Britney Spears or anything. I mean, you search for business. You want to see some multimedia top. You want to see a map. You want to see a picture. In this case, um, this is several years now. You know, you actually could, it would actually give you links to the content. So you could actually hear some of her songs. And so the whole idea is this is to make it a, a one-click experience. You click on search and here's your result. You can see her top four songs or whatever that, you know, was decided was important. And people like that and it's a, it's a good thing. And then people started, oh, so you can play the music. And then people started looking at things like recent images. So it turns out that people are very interested in recent content. They want to see the new stuff. And again, this is very true for multimedia. And so these things get a lot of, a lot of hits. And then, and then what was added, I'm sorry. So, so the question is, is, does relevance matter? And a few years ago, after the top stuff was done, people started putting on also search for items. So if you go to the bo bottom of the Yahoo search page, and I'm pretty sure Google and everybody else is doing it now, but this is the bottom of the Yahoo page, you do a search for Britney Spears, and you show Angelina Jolie, Jessica Simpson, Lindsay Lohan. And what's really interesting is that these, three Im these images on the bottom get just as many clicks as the ones on the top. <coughs> so I told you about the, the, the exponential fall off on, on relevance and click through. We're telling people this is the wrong result and they're still clicking on it. I mean, we're not trying to fool anybody. So, I mean, you know, you have to, I mean, the users are doing what, they're doing what they want. And so it's really interesting that they're searching for Britney Spears and they're happily clicking on, on Jessica Simpson. And I think what's important to remember, especially if there's any IR people in the, in the audience, is that when you're doing multimedia search, it's really not an informational search. Um, you're not looking for the cure for AIDS or, you know, the hours of your pizza joint. You know, you're looking for entertainment. And so we see this as, a, as an important distinction between normal text-based search and, um, and multimedia, entertainment, images, um, and, and content like that. So it's a different problem when you start doing a multimedia with audio and video, and I think that's what makes it fun. The text people can do the boring stuff. We get the fun stuff. Um, the other reason that um, 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 this is an interesting problem is because the scale is, is so different from what we're used to, um, especially for those of us like me who grew up in the engineering world where you deal with one signal at a time. Um, the music people came to me many years ago and said, we have this catalog, at the time it was two million songs, so you could probably figure out how long ago that was. Um, and they said, you know, we want to figure out where the duplicates are. We want to figure out what songs are related to what other songs. When someone comes into us with a song request, if we don't have it, we either want to give them a version from our catalog or, or you know, 
find out where it is on the web. We want to be able to answer the query no matter where it comes from. And we want to do it as well as we can in the face of all sorts of weird things going on with requests. And so it's really easy to formulate the problem. We want to do cross-correlation. We want to say, well, how similar is this song snippet to that song snippet? Not a big deal. It's really easy to talk about until you start thinking about the scale of things. So we have two million songs, three minutes um, per song, 10 frames per second. And you quickly get this cross-correlation matrix that's 3.6 billion by 3.6 billion in size. And so you really can't deal with um, the problem in the, in the, in the normal manner. Um, you know, you can't brute force this. And so I spent a lot of time working with Mike Casey, and, and that's developed in a number of interesting ways, on understanding um, how you deal with data in these large fashions. And it's very different. And the most important way it's different is, what's known as, is because of what's known as the cursor dimensionality. So we're all used to measure, measuring distance in, in a two-dimensional grid. So the distance from me to the camera is one distance. And it's really easy to talk about that. And it's a fairly uniform distribution. But when you start talking about high dimensional spaces, all our intuitions go away. And so what you're seeing here are, I don't know how many plots is this, eight plots, eight curves, as a function of dimensions for just random data, random data on a, on a plane or on a, in a space. So here's a four-dimensional four dimensional space. And it has a particular distribution of distance versus frequency. It's fairly broad. And then as you get to higher and higher dimensions, so in this case, we go up to a 512 dimensional space. The distance from any one point to any other random point becomes narrower and narrower. Which has interesting ramifications because in one sense, in, in, the, in the worst possible sense, it says it's an ill-posed problem. If you want to ask how, how similar this song is to this other song, it's ill-posed in the sense that, well, you know, any song is about the same distance away in this high-dimensional space. And it also has ramifications on how you do the search because you can't do indexing in this space very easily. So we spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, and it's, it's made difficult because of the cursor dimensionality. And so there's some, some computer science issues in working with this, these, these large databases, and it makes it a lot of fun. We've got some new results that I'm not talking about today, but I can talk about later if you like, on how to, how to make sense of all this. And it turns out the real world is not high dimensional. I mean, the, so when we do the song similarity thing, we, we tend to do, actually I think it was 480 dimensions. So the work that Mike Casey and I were doing had a 480 dimensional feature vector. We took the song, we, we, we summarized it over seconds, and, and we're left with 480 dimensions. And we're not arguing that the, that the inherent dimensionality of the music is 480 dimensional, because there's a lot of regularity. This note follows this note follows this note. There's a lot of harmonicity. Things you know, are well behaved. So unless you're listening to white noise, the intrinsic dimensionality is much less. And so we're starting to, to think about those problems and having a lot of fun. Um, Oh, the, the, the thing that makes it, so actually my boss wrote one of the papers talking about how this is an impossible problem. He comes from the database world. What makes it a solvable problem is we really care about what's in the left tail. So you've heard about the long tail. That's usually stuck way over in the right-hand side of the tail. We're only interested in this thing. So there might be billions of, I mean, there's definitely billions of things in this, in this main peak, but we're looking for the half dozen items that are off on the left tail. So that's what makes it a, a well-posed problem. Um, so I want to talk about um, some content issues and, and what it, why the problem's hard. I mean, one, the problem's hard because it's a lot of data. The problem is also hard because of the semantic gap. These are, um, I don't know, 20 images from Flickr that I collected at one point. I think it's just the first 20 Flickr images. And I'm sorry it's hard to see, but it's not really important. Um, you know, this has Tokyo in it. Um, if you could see it very well, this looks like a you know, typical Tokyo street sign. Um, but there's a whole bunch of images. You can probably sell this as a car. And you're probably wondering why a car image is in, is, in this picture, is in this collection. And people use tags in lots of different ways. And a common way that people use tags um, on, on Flickr is they tag them with things that are important to them. And you know, one possible reason this is there is that there's some car buff who goes to Tokyo once every five years and goes to the Tokyo Auto Show. And so as far as this user is concerned, this is Tokyo for him. Because you know he went to Tokyo, and, and all three dozen pictures he took in Tokyo or in Japan on that trip were there for Tokyo. He doesn't know where the suburbs are. <laughs> and you know, this isn't very meaningful for Tokyo for any of you. 
you know, but it, for him it was. And so the semantics are a really hard problem. So I think a good example of that is um, the semantic issue about, you know, what, what do things mean? What do words mean? This is ignoring the language issues. Those of you that grew up in, in the North like I do, think of Christmas like this with warm clothing inside. It's dark because, you know, the sun's gone down. And this is Christmas. But if you grew up in Australia and every, every Christmas day you went for a walk on the beach with Uncle Bob, then a picture of Uncle Bob means Christmas to you. And so, you know, we're not going to argue with that characterization, but Christmas means different things to different people, just like blues means different things to different people. And so you can sort of look at ensembles and, and big generalizations. But the semantic, this is, this is an example of a semantic gap, and it's a really difficult problem. Because people come to us and say, well, show me pictures of Christmas. And do we show this picture, or do we show that picture? Or they could come to us asking for blues. You know, what, what's the answer? And so we spent a lot of time um, thinking about that. So I want to talk about these two aspects of our work, one based on more data and the other based on, on better data or different data. Um, and I wanted to use this work from a few years ago um, that Kyogo Lee did, a student of mine who's now in Seoul, on chord recognition. And I think this approach typifies the, the way that people have been doing internet scale applications by throwing more data at it. The speech recognition people figured out a long time ago, it doesn't matter how smart you are, they're really smart people, you always get better answers if you use more data. And that's what Kyogo did for, for the chord recognition problem. And I think he had a particularly clever solution for the problem because labeling data is really hard. I don't know if any of you label data, but it's no fun. And you need a lot of data for this. And so I think Kyogo was smart, but the smartest thing he did was to cheat. And the way he cheated was he started with symbolic music. He started with MIDI music. And from the symbolic data, he can do, go two different ways. On the left-hand side, he can, go, he can figure out from symbolic analysis what the chords are in the key. And so that gives him labels for everything. And going down the right-hand side, he can synthesize from the MIDI in lots of different fashions. So he can synthesize a string quartet. He can string, synthesize piano. He can even, even synthesize a bagpipe quartet. And so from MIDI data, he can synthesize lots and lots of data. It's not going to be musically wonderful, but it's good data. And he can then use that to train models. In this case, he trained um, HMM models that are very, very rich. So he can train a model for bagpipe music of the Beatles, <laughs> you know, in the key of C. And he'll have the best model for that. <laughs> And he can do the same thing for classical, or he can say, well, here's a, here's a model for all of classical, or whatever else he wants. And it's very smart because it knows what an A looks like, or an A sharp. It's very smart because it knows that the probability of an A sharp followed by a B is going to be you know, fairly small. And so it can learn all these things. So Kai-Fu Lee was the first one that popularized this approach. Um, he, didn't invent, he didn't invent HMMs, but he's the one that made them successful first. And people like to joke that Kai-Fu Lee never looked at a speech waveform in his life. But he knew how to build these models. And he didn't have to look at speech. He doesn't, I mean, to be overly blunt, he's, he's a smart guy. To be overly blunt, he doesn't know anything about speech. <laughs> but he can build these models. And, and these models are now much more effective than anything else for doing all sorts of speech problems. So the, the speech recognition in your phone is based on lots and lots of data in these models. Um, people used to do segmentation by, or labeling a segmentation of speech by looking at it, you know, get linguists to look at the boundaries between A and E and figure out this is where the boundary was and do segmentation. Here's the phoneme, here's the vowel, here's the, the constant and stuff like that. And they'd argue about it and it would take a lot of time. Now people just throw HMMs at the problem and it works really well. And, and the models are really, really smart. So here's a, um, um, a transition probability matrix learned by one of the, by Kyogo's, Kyogo's model um, for what is it, one, two, three, 36 different chords um, in classical music from one chord to the other and in Beatles data from one chord to the other. And I'm not enough of a musician to be able to tell why there's particular patterns. But, but there are patterns there that the system learns and, and they help make this, the chord recognition work really well. So at the time when he did this, I don't know if this is still true, at the time he did this, this was the world's best chord recognition system. And he did it by throwing lots of data at the problem. 
we've been looking at a couple different other kinds of problems um, with slightly different um, um, solutions. A lot of people think about um, query suggestion or not or tag suggestion or um, you know, tag suggestion. And um, I did some work with Killian Weinberger, who's now at Washington University, on this problem. So, how would you tag this photograph? What would you use? What words would you use? Suggestions? Huh? Pardon? Bridge. Bridge. Anything else? Golden. San Francisco. Golden Gate. Golden Gate. Anything else? Happy. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one widow. <laughs> you didn't say Tokyo. <laughs> Actually, I looked at all the pictures of Golden Gate that were in our database. And there's one that has a GPS location of Kansas. <laughs> and the reason why was that this artist had made a model or done some artwork of the Golden Gate Bridge, or maybe it was San Francisco. And was, he had done it in, in Kansas, but it was being shipped to San Francisco. So, you know, it was true. It was, it was Golden Gate Bridge, but it happened to be taken in Kansas because this was. <laughs> um, so we argue that most of the tags that you suggested are, I mean, they're all right, except for happy. Um, <laughs> You know, these are all right, but if you have Golden Gate, what a normal tag suggestion system, that's what I was looking for, tag suggestion. A normal tag suggestion system will say, oh, Golden Gate. That means that San Francisco and California are likely tags. And we're going to argue that that's really a wrong answer. That's really not useful. You know, just looking at the data, I can tell you that San Francisco and California are the right tags to add to Golden Gate. There's very little information there. And instead, what you really want to do is you want to use tag suggestion system to do something that machines can't do. And what, people, what machines can't do is, is, is understand where the ambiguity is. So in the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, there's, it's a fairly narrow kind of photograph. I mean, there's night and day. There's fog and no fog. There's maybe five different positions around the bridge you can take a picture of the bridge. You know, those are the things you want to you ask. And so what you really want to do is figure out, given something about the image, maybe just one tag, you want to figure out where the ambiguity is so you can ask users what, the real, um, what else do they need to know. And so this is consistently built using the data we have to understand ambiguity and suggest the right things. It's a form of active learning if you uh, are a machine learning person. And it's based on this kind of uh, model. Um, I only have one more. Well, these are only equations in the paper. I should say that all the work I'm describing here are, are fairly major efforts. And I'm only giving you a flavor of the work. I don't want to go into all the details. I'm happy to answer questions. There's a one hour talk about all these subjects. <laughs> Um, which I can go into great depth about. But I just want to give you a flavor of why it's interesting because I think the, the flavor is what's important for you guys going forward in your own research. So the way we solve this problem is we look at um, word histograms. And this is a histogram over all, well, you know, say six million words in our database. So we know every, we know every tag that's been used by anybody in Flickr. And we can form a probability distribution. How often does the word cat appear? How often does the word golden gate appear? And how often does the word Tokyo up here and happy. And what you're seeing here are two different distributions. Um, you can sort of see it. There's, there's a line here and a line here. So there's two different bumps here um, for the word Cambridge. And as you know, there's two different Cambridges at least. Um, and we expect different word distributions for Cambridge, Massachusetts, because it's going to be MIT and Harvard and Tuscanese, versus Cambridge, which is going to be, you know, I don't know what's appropriate in Cambridge. Uh, punting. Um, and, and we expect to see different words in different occasions. And so the way we want to solve the problem is we want to find word distributions that maximize the, the difference and the, the information we have. And so what you're seeing here is the probability of any word given the tag Cambridge. And then we have two refinements. This curve is the probability of any tag given Cambridge plus, which one is this? Massachusetts. And this distribution is Cambridge plus UK. And the way we want to solve the problem is we want to use the fact that these distributions of words are different and identify the tags that give the maximum information content, give us the maximum information about what's going on. And so in this case, we'll argue that Massachusetts and UK have these completely different, different distributions and if someone gives us Cambridge, what we want to suggest is either Massachusetts or UK because that will give us the most information about what kind of photograph it is. And there's actually some very clever math um, involved in doing this. Um, and it basically comes down to um, this 
piece right here, which is the key part. KL is known as the uh, Cahun and Loeb um, distance, uh, Kublak, I'm sorry, Kublak Liebler distance, which is a way of measuring the, the difference between true probability distributions. So we had these two distributions here, this distribution and this distribution. Again, this is over all possible words. And the Kublak Liebler distance is a way of saying how different these distributions are. So what we want to do is we want to find um, distribution, find words T1 and T2 where the Kublak Lieber distance is maximized. <coughs> and we can do this fairly efficiently. We, have, we happen to use a grid for it, but it worked pretty well. These two terms in front are because we don't want to pick things that are rare. So if you're looking for Cambridge, you know, we don't want to look at elephant as T1 because elephant isn't very common. And even though the distribution here might be very different, it's not a very meaningful tag in this context. So we want to pick tags that are meaningful in the context, T1 and T2, they have maximum distance. And it turns out this works pretty well. Um, these are some of the results we got. Again, this is all just from the data. It turns out when we did this experiment at one point, the most ambiguous term we saw was republic. And the two most important ways of, of distinguishing those two words, that word was Czech and Dominican. I mean, there's lots of ways. We only did this for pairwise. We didn't do the, the extension to multiple dimensions or multiple words. So that's a geographic ambiguity. We got a conceptual ambiguity because Java can either mean um, the country Indonesia or the conference Java 1. So this being Silicon Valley, we got lots of pictures of Java 1 in our database. Um, there could be a language ambiguity. Um, so Kobe could either be Japan and, is this Kobe? Yeah. In Japanese. So we could see a language ambiguity that we could resolve. Um, there's a temporal ambiguity, so relief could either be Katrina or tsunami. So you can tell when we did this, it was just after, which one came second? It was just after the second one when we did this work. So we had lots of images in our database of that. And then we see some mistakes. So um, at the time, um, there's this guy, um, Nelson Miguel, who had been putting in lots of photos. And so lots of photos were tagged with his name. Um, and so Sam Miguel was another ambiguity resolving things. And we call this an artifact because, you know, it's just the way the data fell out. Um, and the reason I can talk about it and not be embarrassed is because I'm pretty sure that six months later it was no longer a problem because Flickr's growing at, you know, doubling every six months. And I'm pretty sure he was not doubling his photo output as fast as the rest of the world was. So, you know, we can do that sort of thing and get good results. And then we, we validate it with this um, experiment. This is, um, we, could, we could do this validation in both space, time, and semantically. Um, but this is um, for space, and elephants was an ambiguous word, and we plotted a black dot where all the elephants were physically. So we had geographic locations on a lot of these photographs. And the two things that were most important, two terms that most disambiguated that were Thailand and Africa. And if we look at the, the photographs that were tagged with Thailand, they formed these red dots, and if we look at the ones that tagged Africa, we got these other dots. And so we argued that, that this is actually really mapping into the real world in the sense that we did this all mathematically and yet it actually has a physical manifestation. And we see this in lots of different kinds of data. So this happened to be with um, image data, but we'd see the same sort of thing in, in other dimensions. Um, we've also spent a lot of time trying to understand um, how do we get useful data out of tags. And you know, I make fun of tags and I say they're bad, and you get all the sorts of Tokyo effects and Christmas effects, but they're still valuable data. And so the real question is, how do, you, how do you make it reliable? And so this is by analogy to the ESP game. Do you guys know about the ESP game? I know you do. Has anybody else looked at the ESP game or seen it? Um, Doug has done a musical equivalent of this. Um, okay. Um, so I'll try not to make too much fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really brilliant. Louis Van Am did it. Uh, games with a purpose, he did a great job. He got an amazing number of hits. He got a faculty job at CMU for it. Um, you know, that by itself is a good, good sign. Um, but we argue it's the wrong approach, or at least it's not the best approach you can use. So in the ESP game, they put up a photograph, and here's the photograph, and you're playing against somebody else. And you're supposed to type in words that describe the picture. And if two people, if the two people, the two game players, type in the same word, then you win. And so this person, so house, plant, and room have already been said as taboo. You're not allowed to use those. Someone's already put those words in. They, don't, they know that house, plant, and room are all words for this thing. And then 
I guess I was doing this. Actually, it was, that wouldn't be a word I'd use, unless sure I could spell it. Um, but this person put in corridor and columns, and he hadn't gotten a match yet. And so he's playing against someone who had guessed some other words. And when both people tag it with the same word, that's a really good indication that that word applies to that photograph or that piece of music in Doug's case. Um, but the problem with that is that it's a, it's a very difficult task. And so in this case, they can do pretty well. So don't anybody say anything, but I just want you to raise your hand if, if you know what this building is. Wow, that's the highest ratio I've seen of any audience. Huh? Yeah, it is Quebec. So this is Notre Dame. Most audiences I show this to, I might be lucky if I get 20%, sometimes 10%. This is the most famous cathedral in, in the world, and you guys are good. Um, but how about that one? Don't even try. This is Augsburg, Germany. You know, Augsburg, Germany's cathedral. You know, I happen to be there for a conference. You know, it's just an example. But that's valuable information. And you'd never get Augsburg from the inverse ESP game, or from the ESP game. And you know, most audiences, you might get one person from Montreal and someone else from California. Your chances of getting Notre Dame for this in the ESP game are <laughs> pretty small. So it's, it's a hard problem. So what we want to do is turn the problem around. So they're not going to get this. Um, tags are noisy. These are tags for Christmas. And you know, I have no idea why this is labeled Christmas. <laughs> so we wanted to turn the problem around. This is the way the ESP game does it. You got this picture. Here's Notre Dame again. Player one is guessing these words. Player two guesses those words. You get answers a lot of times, like sky and building. And I don't know why vacation would be there. Um, but anyway, so you get some tags. And you never get Augsburg from that, from that situation. Instead, we wanted to do it the opposite way. <coughs> So we have a photographer that's taking a picture like this. And we have another photographer that's taking a picture like this. And we know how to match up these two photographs. It takes a lot of CPU time, but CPU time is cheap. Getting people is hard. <laughs> As Louis Van Am found, it, you know, it's very hard to get people to do this. But we've got you know, lots of computers. And so this user labeled this Notre Dame, Par Paris, France, vacation. This one labeled Paris, France, Cathedral, Notre Dame. And given that we can tell that these two photos are very similar, we can tell that, that, that Paris and France and Notre Dame are all good tags for this photograph. And so this is the kind of you know, thing we do. We, we started out with 104,000 Flickr photographers. You know, that they took 19 million photographs. And um, I forget how we got the queries. We had a million queries. We put it into Hadoop, Hadoop, which is our big cluster. So it just makes it easy to get lots of CPU time. And we get results like this. So we found 7% of the images had matches. And so we had 160,000 pairs of images that we got reliable tags for. And this is just um, 19 million. That's only 1% of Flickr, less than 1% of Flickr. And we're not doing anything magic. I mean, it seems like magical. We're saying, you know, we've identified this as a common king picture from the pictures, which if you do computer vision or computer audition, is a really amazing result. But we're not really solving the hard computer problem. We're just saying that two users have identified a picture that's similar and call it common kingfisher. And with that evidence alone, we can do really well. So we're combining the lots and lots of image data, lots and lots of people data, and figuring out that this is a good tag for that problem. And we get all sorts of interesting results. So you know, I had no idea what a BMW is that is, but our users did, and they tagged it correctly, and so we have these two pictures of this, of this bizarre car. And then the, the, um, the, the, the bird that I showed you a few minutes ago. I think what's interesting about the approach, and this was my colleague's um, graph, and he did a great job, is it, it gets information about the image that we couldn't get in other ways. So what you're seeing on the horizontal axis there is how often the tag occurs in our database. And we're using that as a proxy for how specific is it. So, I think the most common word, well, certainly in the top 10, the most common word is wedding, followed maybe by 2010 and 2009 and 2008. Um, so, you know, it's a photographic collection and there's lots of wedding pictures. But there's a lot of words that are, so that's over here, that's showing up lots of times. There's lots of words that only show up once or twice. So you're seeing from 
from very specific to very general. And there's two curves here. We did an ESP simulation. We just sort of faked it up and gave people images and asked them to play this game and collected the words. And the ESP game gave us all these words that were very frequent, like wedding was over here. And the, 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 the reliable tags thing we're doing mostly skewed, what, three orders of magnitude less frequent. So we got these very specific tags. And these specific tags are very valuable. And so that's why we think it's a good approach. Um, because what we're harvesting is, is these really smart photographers. The photographer knows he's in front of Notre Dame. He took it, he put it on there, you know, it's probably meaningful. And we're avoiding the problem of the tag noise because it's very unlikely that, that two people are going to go to Tokyo and label a black car Tokyo because you know, they happen to be in the Tokyo car show. And so, you know, we get, we get good results. Um, as I mentioned before, we did a lot of work on, on, on neighborhood retrieval, figuring out nearest neighbors. And this is work I did with Mike Casey, who was at um, uh, Goldsmith and is now at Dartmouth. Um, and it's actually in California this week. I saw him Monday. And Yuri Lipschitz, who was a, 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 a theoretical computer science uh, person who helped me with some of the numerics. Um, this is the way we see the, the music similarity problem. On the very right-hand side are things like genre recognition. And genre recognition is just labeling it with a tag. Is it blues? Is it jazz? Is it happy? It's a very generic problem. On the left-hand side is fingerprinting, like what Shazam does. You know, here's a, here's a sound from a noisy bar, identify it. And, and they have very good solutions to both those problems. And I think the interesting problem is in the middle, um, both in remixes and in things like cover songs. And in some sense, we, they're different problems, but we solve them in the same kind of approach, which is a nearest neighbor approach. How do you, how do you put things in a, in a space so that you can talk about them and, and find them in, in, in space? I find them in this, in this Euclidean space of some sort, because that's the easiest way to put them in a database. It's an interesting problem for us because um, just Madonna, for example, this is two, four, six, eight, nine. Not, Madonna has nine different versions of this song in our commercial database, and this is a few years ago. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more now. And we certainly can identify some of them from the names, but we'd like to be able to do better than that. We'd like to be able to put them all together and, and figure out what's going on. And then it's even harder when you start, um, oh, and then plus the video. So there's a lot of, lot of duplication out there. And that's just a Madonna. You know, when you start adding all the people that are doing her songs, it's even bigger. And then there's all sorts of remix examples. So this is um, Mike Casey's um, examples, um, showing different versions of a song that Abby, Abby did. So there's the original. And then, um, oops, Madonna did her version. And then Tracy Young, who's a, um, a DJ in Miami, I believe, did a couple versions. And we want to be able to mix all these, we want to be able to match all these things together. So in a sense, they're all, oh. Uh, I, um, my virus detection kicked in. I shouldn't, shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't have connected the network. <laughs> I got an email with a virus in it. Sorry about that. And then, and then Tracy Young did another version. So they're all quite different. Okay. So these are signals we want to identify and, and work with. And the way we do it is by analogy to the web search people who work with this thing called shingles. So shingles are little bits of text. And every web search engine in the world uses this to figure out where the duplicates are. So you, you crawl on the web, the web is a really nasty place, lots of duplicates, lots of different ways to get to the same content. People are copying it, like Wikipedia pages show up in many different websites. And no user wants to see 10 copies of the same thing on a search result. And so the first thing they do is dedupe. And they do it with this algorithm called shingles, and there's a very uh, practical algorithm called locality sense of hashing that makes it, makes it workable. And I'll talk about that in a second. But a shingle in the audio case is a section of audio in a feature space. And so we're going to take, um, um, and in this case, it's 12-dimensional chromogram. So we have 12 notes on a piano keyboard. And we're going to look at the frequency content within this octave, all collapsed onto itself, over time. And I believe this, oh, it's 50 frames we used in this case. So that would be five seconds of audio 
Actually, I'm not sure what the frame rate was in this case. But anyway, and it, it gives us a 600-dimensional six, feature vector. So we have every, every bit of music is going to be represented by 600 numbers, 600-dimensional vector. And we want to be able to find out which vectors are similar to what other vectors. And conceptually, it's very easy. We have this query. And then we just want to, we want to um, go across the sound looking for the best match. And so in this case, um, the query matches you know, the time, what's that, time 310 or 300 really well. And we want to be able to do this in 20 milliseconds because that's what we have on a search budget um, when users give us a search. So any of you that have taken computer science courses know about hashing. Um, at least it used to be very common 20 years ago when I took compiler classes because you have this, all these words, you want to figure out where they are in memory. You don't want to look at every word. And so the computer science solution is called hashing. And what it does is it takes a, a, a symbol, it takes a string of, of digits or a string of letters and makes a function out of it and then, and then that points into a table. And the function is designed so that things that are close together, like bar and baz, get put in very different tables, or very different positions in the table. So you do this numerical calculation and you immediately jump to the right location in memory to figure out where it is. And it's a very important thing in, in lots of different algorithms. But that's exactly the wrong thing to do for these nearest neighbor problems. Because what we want to do is find points that are close to each other. So given bar, we want to find that baz. And we can't look at every two million, we can't look at all two million points. I mean, that's just not going to be workable. We need to find an index. Um, I like talking about this because um, I worked with a group, I, this, is my, this is my way of penance. Um, I worked with a group at IBM that did computer science theory. And we could never figure out what they were doing. And they never got any funding, but we still had to pay their salary. And we were all kind of annoyed at them. But the, the theory people came up with this algorithm, and it's very clever. And I wish I had done it. Um, the idea, and this is what makes a really hard problem really easy. The idea is that if you take some data, and I like to use my fingers, and if, if you project it against the screen or project it with a dot product in the computer, then two points that are close together will stay close together no matter what direction you, you project it from. But if two points are far apart, then you know, very rarely will they be on top of each other, but generally they're very, they'll stay far apart. It's even more true in high dimensions. And so the, theory, the, the secret of locality sensitive to hashing is to project the numbers onto a, a grid, or project them onto a, a line, and, um, and look for collisions. And you do it multiple times. And so it's, it's a new class of algorithms called randomized algorithms. They don't guarantee the right solution. They don't guarantee they'll always find the right solution. But you know what? On the web, it doesn't matter. You know, so what, once in a while, you miss the exact nearest neighbor for Madonna. You know, you know, no one's going to know. And if you really care, then you do it more often. And you do it to more depth, and you, and you lower the probability as low as you want it. And it's still more efficient than brute force. So you're doing these projections, and so these points point to different places on the grid. Um, on the data set I'm working with for um, audio right now, I think we're doing about 20 of these, 20 different directions. And then each one of those becomes a, a, a multidimensional point in, a, in a, a word, in a dictionary. And so then you do L of these things. So you get K of these, L of these things, where each one of these is a different dictionary. And so you might do on the order of 10 different dictionaries. So you have these K-dimensional points. They're all integers because you quantize to a bucket. And you have you know, L of these dictionaries. And that becomes a, a, point, a, a way to look up the data point, a way, a way to look up the data. And we can do that very quickly. You do this um, computer science hash at this point for efficiency reasons, and you count the matches. And so it turns out we can do this very quickly. Um, I don't remember in the audio database, but on a, on a database of, of shopping images from um, Taiwan, um, I can do it in three milliseconds in a million images. So give me an image. I can find the closest image in three milliseconds using this kind of randomized algorithm. And I think, of, I think at the time when I did this, this when I, in, the, the probability success depends on the parameters. So I think when I did the probability, when I did the model for the data I just gave you, I think I had a 30% chance of missing the nearest neighbor. But if I want to make it, reduce it to you know, 3%, I just have to do more of these dictionaries, and, and we can get arbitrary precision. But again, it's very fast. Um, these are some figures showing how it behaves as you change the parameters. So if you just have one projection, all these points in red will project to the same point on the line. And then if you do two projections, you get this direction and this direction, and only these points will be collisions. And the problem with LSH is that you know, if this is your query point right here, 
then you'll see the, the neighbors here, but you won't see the neighbors here. And so that's why you do this multiple times. And so here we've done um, two-dimensional projections. We've done it 10 different times. And the, and the redness of the dot, the redness of the x, shows um, how likely are you, to, are you to find the right answer. Um, one of the problems with LSH is you have to set the search range. You have to set the bucket size. And so if you set it too small, nothing will collide, and you, don't, you won't find anything at all. And if you set it too large, you get all the points, and then you can't, you know, then you're back to brute force. It's, it's really hard to, to deal with. And so we've got some new math that we're working on that, that starts with this data. So this is the, this is the data. I don't remember if this is audio data or, or shopping data, image data. But they look this, I mean, they have the same behavior. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just data. <laughs> um, but this is the distribution for the nearest point. Actually, I think this is shopping data because you see more duplicate images in shopping. So there's a, a little bump here where you, know, you have two pictures of the same handbag in our database. And you don't often see that in the audio data I'm looking at. So here's the distribution of distance and probability for the nearest neighbor. And here's the, here's the probability distribution for the, any neighbor, one point to any other neighbor in the database. And you can see these are fairly sharp. And it's also, they're very close to each other. And so you have a really hard problem. But we can, we can transform this into probabilities of bucket collision. So we have this bucket that we're going to say, you know, we're going we're to project it and then put it in a bucket, and the bucket size changes. This is the probability, as a function of bucket size, from small to large, of the nearest neighbor and any neighbor showing up in the, in the right bin, or the same bin. And we've got some analysis I can show later. Um, actually, the paper's due in two weeks. That, that talks about how to pick the, pick the parameters that maximize this distance. And we can you know, optimize this algorithm really well. It's the first time anybody's been able to do it. These are some results that um, Mike Casey did. Um, um, these are remixes. So I, I forget where he got the data. These are you know, musical remixes. And um, we can fit the, fit the distribution of the different things and predict kind of results we're going to get. And it's worked out really well for a lot of stuff that Mike Casey's been doing as part of the Amras um, project. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, so everything I've talked about so far has been more data. And I want to talk about some other solutions that are based on, yeah, I can do that, on um, different kinds of data. I call it better data, but that's really a, a misnomer. <laughs> um, but just to give you a flavor for the kind of things that we're doing, the first thing we did, this is based on music data. Um, and actually, it was presented at Izmir, so I'm sure you've seen it before, on item to item similarity. So most of my career, I've been interested in similarity. How do you figure out two timbres are similar? How do you figure out that two users are similar? In this case, we're looking at how similar two pieces of music. And this is motivated by um, a discussion I saw at Izmir many years ago, um, where Steve Downey was talking about his system for, what do they call it, Capitron? Or, I, he has a system, really great at the time, that makes it really easy for users to, to listen to two pieces of music and say how similar they are. And he was talking about how wonderful it was and how fast it was. And some lady in the back put her hand up and said, um, it's taking an hour to make a decision. And she was being really, I mean, she, wasn't, she was making, she was being really careful and spending a lot of time on this decision. It was way more time than necessary. But it's a really hard problem. How do you decide if two songs are similar? So we have Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday um, songs. And if you're a jazz, jazz lover, um, those two songs are like night and day. And the problem is that that these decisions are very context dependent. So if you're a punk rocker in London, they're both elevator music. And, and you can't hear the difference. And so asking people how similar two things is just really content and context dependent. And so it's really an ill-posed ill problem. And so what we wanted to do was look at the data that we had. And this is an example of item to item similarity if you're from the recommendation field. So, but the basic idea is you have these three songs, one, two, and three. And you have a jazz lover, a rock lover, and a classical lover rate the songs. And we're going to argue that song one and song three are, are, are similar because the jazz lover and the rock lover and the classical lover all rate it in the same way. So I don't, know what, I don't know what people would, you know, I don't know what kind of song that is. But, but three types of users have all said that their distance to it, their, their, their like of it, how much they like it, are all the same. And so whatever kind of song it is, it, it's probably... These two songs are probably very similar. And song two is very different because you know, it's a classical song that jazz, jazz and rock lovers you know, don't like. 
And so our model for this is um, just look at the data for similarity between you know, one song and another song. And the, the reason I think it's interesting is because we have this song that has three minutes of 44 kilohertz audio. So that's, how many, how many bytes is that? Um, in MP3, it's even less. But it's a lot of data. And we're arguing that giving 2.2 bits of information, we can judge the similarity of the songs. The 2.2 bits are the stars. <laughs> so, you know, people are listening to music on Yahoo Music and Pandora and everything else, and they're giving us ratings. How much do they like the song or not? And we're going to form a rating database of, of this data. In this case, we had uh, 381,000 subjects in our experiment who gave us ratings on 1,000 songs, so we had 1.5 million rating data. And we can do very well with that much data, but it's not the content data. So um, it's very sparse, but you know, we can deal with that. And we did a user test where we um, asked people to look at this playlist and decide whether two songs, whether the playlist was more similar, I'm sorry, how congruent this, the playlist was. And we had three methods, a random approach, one based on the content, and this was, I forget which, whose content-based approach we were using, but it was a fairly typical content approach, and one based on the rating. And it's a bit of a bad argument to make because, you know, certainly people can do better content similarity than we did, but the rating data just was, you know, way better than anything else we had at, at predicting whether two songs were similar or not. So ignore the song and just look at the, and just look at the stars. It turns out the Netflix competition just happened a couple years ago. People spent an inordinate number of hours on it. They spent a lot of time on it. They had access to the content. They had access to the rating data. They had to predict how well will you like this movie. The final solution was this amazing conglomeration of features and data and stuff. They tried everything. But there's one thing that wasn't part of the final solution, and that was content. So, you know, you might be a great fan of war movies or whatever, but they didn't look at the movie to decide that. They looked at the ratings for it. And part of that's because looking at the content is really hard. Um, part of it's because movies are much more difficult to characterize because they're, you know, two hours long compared to three minutes. But in the end, 2.2 bits of stars was, you know, winning the day. And I, I, just to give you an idea of what kind of data is out there, this is um, a data set that we have. Um, this, is, um, this is a database that's available to academic researchers. It's 700 million ratings um, from Yahoo Music. And we were kind of surprised. Actually, Ben Marlin did this um, when he was at Toronto. Um, it has a U-shaped um, curve like this. And it's really kind of interesting because it's, it's real data. Um, it's interesting because we've got two users, at least at the time we did this, we have two users who rated more than a million songs each. So think about that, a million songs. They clicked on a, on a, on a star a million times. Um, we're pretty sure they're real users. I mean, they, they went out and talked to them or something. We're not sure they have a real life. <laughs> 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 anyway, the U-shaped curve is really interesting. Um, Ben Marlin was very interested in, in this assumption that the collaborative filter people make that, that people rate songs at random. And it turns out that people don't rate songs at random. They rate the things they like or they don't like. And so what Ben did, he did this great experiment where we, we asked subjects to rate 10 songs they'd never heard. We just took 10 songs out of our database, played them for users and say, tell us what you think of them. So this is things that we chose for them and they had to rate. And it took us a while to get through all the security, security restrictions at Yahoo and, and get the advertisement set up right. But Ben called, we were hoping for a few hundred subjects. Ben called me a few hours after the experiment went live and we already had 2,000 subjects in a couple hours. In a week we had 35,000 subjects. So we had great fun. We got 350,000 ratings. This data set's also available. Um, but what's interesting is, um, we, oh, I'm sorry, the curve came up and I didn't notice. So what's interesting is that this is the rating we got. And so most people hated most songs. Most people didn't like a lot of songs. And most people only really liked a lot of, very few songs. And we thought this was interesting. It's just this, this very, very straight curve. And the air bars are teeny tiny um, with 35,000 subjects. And the reason we think that, I mean, this is hand waving, but the reason we think that this curve happens is because the likelihood of playing a song for anyone usually we hope is like this. Well, I mean, we hope it's like this. It's probably more like this. If we're doing our job right and playing songs that people want to hear, it's like that. And if you multiply this curve times this curve, 
get a curve that looks like that. And so the real, the real data is really interesting. Um, and they're both available, so see me if you have questions. In the last few minutes, I just want to talk about um, something we just are publishing next week, actually, um, and a related problem. One of the problems we have at Yahoo, everybody has this problem, but you know, our, we've been dealing with it at Yahoo too, is how do, you how do you identify certain kinds of content? The most important content for Yahoo and any search engine to identify is adult content, because a lot of people don't want to see it. And it's a really hard problem, and so there's people, the solution we used to have, based on some work out of Bangalore, were these things that look for body parts. And it worked really well. But then you look at the places where it makes mistakes, and they're really ambiguous images. And so what we wanted to do was look at how can we do the problem in addition to looking at the content. So we're, we're not going to look at the content like we did for, you know, for recommendations, but instead we want to look at the web graph. And so this is what the web looks like. And so you have web pages that point to adult images, or these could be cricket images or blues images or whatever your content is. And you have other pages that point to kittens or jazz or something else. And the web is not symmetric. Well, the web is symmetric in the sense that lots of things point to other things. But it's also asymmetric in the sense that, that adult content points to other adult content and sometimes points to non-adult content. But you very seldom find a link from, from non-adult content to adult content. And there's always exceptions. But in general, the, the information flow is this way from adult to adult and adult to non-adult, but not from non-adult to adult. And the, the idea that we were looking at is that some images are easy to determine that are adult or not. So this is clearly not adult. That's clearly adult. And there's a whole bunch of images that are ambiguous. And it's really pretty amazing if you look at the ambiguous images. So we have human editors look at some of them. And there's, there's all sorts of ways that people can be ambiguous in sexual matters. Um, but we just use Marilyn Monroe as an example. And, the, and the, the idea of this work is that if you have um, um, a web page and a web graph, you can do much better at, at, at determining what's going on. So if this picture is being pointed to by an adult web page, then this is probably an adult image. And if this image is being pointed to by a non-adult page, then it's probably non-adult. So we can use the context of the, of the data to make, make a decision. Um, I'm not going to go through the graph. It's basically a support vector solution. But what I really wanted to do was show you this graph. So we know a lot about image analysis, image recognition. Um, this wasn't a state-of-the-art image recognizer, but it was, it was pretty good. And if we look at just the image features alone, it's the orange curve, bottom, lousy. And that's what we're, you know, we've been using so far. If we add the text features, that does pretty well. I'm sorry, if we look at the web graph, we do really well by itself. So just ignoring the content, just looking at the content, just looking at what pages are around it. Um, we do really well. Um, text doesn't add much. Actually, text hurts for a while until you get enough data. Um, if you add the image features, you do better. And you do the best if you add web, image, and text features together, all together. And so we're solving this multimedia recognition problem, multimedia classification problem, looking at all the data we have. If you only had to choose one piece of data, it'd be the web graph. Um, and obviously, we can do the best if we use all three. And so I think the, the moral of all this is that there's lots and lots of ways of, of solving these problems. And um, oh, actually, let me skip ahead to some stuff. I've got a whole bunch of slides on um, machine learning approaches to you know, solving these problems. And, and these are the kind of solutions we use when we have you know, 4 million songs or 5 billion images. And these kind of algorithms work really well at, at scale. But I wanted to close just by saying um, that there's lots of ways of, of, oh, this is the kind of solution we use, Hadoop. And again, I can talk to you about it later. Um, there's all sorts of ways of solving these problems. And a lot of the ways look, involve looking at the content. You know, you have to look at the content and, and decide whether it's C sharp or D or whether it's a, this is whether a drum beat occurs or not. And what we've learned over the last 20 years is that more data wins. So throw lots and lots of data at the problem. Don't try to be smart. Just, you know, we've got data. Use it. And with the internet, that's really quite doable. And we've solved chord recognition. We've, we've done a whole bunch of stuff with tagging and finding nearest neighbors in that fashion. And now I think what we're learning over the last five, or t five years or so and what's going forward in the future is there's a, this data is not, doesn't exist in isolation. You know, you might be looking at a um, 
um, a Beethoven symphony. And you might have the content, but you know, don't tie your hand behind your back and say, well, I'm only going to look at the content. Because there's a lot of other data out there. And so you know, we're using things like, you know, do people like the song? It's a really important signal. And that just tells us, you know, it tells us not only do they like it, but also tells us who doesn't like it and what other things are similar. And all this content exists in a web. And I don't mean web with a capital W. I mean web as in it's, interact, it's, it's connected. You're connected with your friends. And so social search is important. Images are, exist on a web page that's owned by somebody. And the fact that a, a picture shows up on ESPN of, of some person like named Michael Jordan is probably really important information. And it's probably the basketball player, not the machine learning person. And so don't try to identify pictures just on the content. You know, use the information you have. And the information we have is, is the web graph and, and all this other information that's out there. And we should be using it. And it's really easy, especially as a student, because I was there at one point, to say, well, I'm going to solve this problem by listening to the content. And what I want to encourage all of you guys to do is, one, look at lots and lots of data, because that's what the, the good solutions are. And don't pigeonhole yourself to say, well, I just have to look at this waveform because you can do a lot more with all the other data that's out there. Um, there's lots of ways of doing these problems. Um, you know, I think I was talking earlier today, a cluster of 100 machines costs less than a year's graduate student salary. So you know, CPU time is not, shouldn't be an issue anymore. Maybe space is an issue and power is an issue, but CPUs are cheap. Data is cheap. You know, there's 4 billion images available for download on, on um, Flickr. Um, I'm pretty sure you can get song excerpts from most of the songs out there. Um, by crawling Amazon and Pandora and places like that. Um, there's lots and lots of data and we should be using it. And it's a brave new world and it's wonderful. So if you have any questions, I'd love to entertain them. Thank you.